maybe you should be able to do an analysis, a precise analysis of what's the thing that added value in you. Right. So in case things change, you can readapt to that thing that you are the best in adding value. That's an interesting question, because if we're talking about threats, to and, and I, I suppose the biggest threat to any language teacher is that technology will actually supersede the need for real people teaching. And there are some amazing things. You just speak into your phone and then you just put it next to the Chinese person and it will say it in perfect Chinese. So that is a danger. And I remember the first time that somebody told me about this, they said, you know, how much longer are you going to be teaching English? You know, how long is your job going to last? Because technology is going to replace you very soon. And he said it would be about five years' time. But I think that's probably why I've diversified a little bit as well. Because, you know, being human to people and, and doing a bit of psychology and distracting them from their workplace, uh, that can't be replaced by an app. That will buy you 10 years more or probably. 20. Yeah, I hope so. And then I can retire, you know, I'm 52 <laughs> now. I, I'm nearly done then. <laughs> Do you think there's a conflict of interest between the institutions who teach English and the people who are taught not only English, but whatever any topic? Language, or any language. Or topic, really. If you are being taught engineering mm -hmm. and there's a way of making you conceive the concepts faster, mm -hmm. they might not be as interested in doing that as you are. Okay. Because that would make their business run out faster. Right. Okay. I suppose it all depends really um, on what the size of the group is that you're teaching. You know, um, if you're the, the whole, the best way to actually teach anybody any, anything is to engage their interest. Yeah, I think as a teacher, you try and position, uh, in my case, learning English uh, as a hobby. You know, people are good at their hobbies, or they they make the things that they're good at their hobbies. Okay. As soon as anything becomes an obligation, um, there's mental resistance to actually learning things. You're doing it for somebody else. You're doing it for the person who's paying for you to do that. You know, your parents, for example, if they're paying you to do English, you're, you know, you just other things you'd much rather do, like play football or do whatever, see your girlfriend. Okay, but so it's very, very easy. It's much, much easier, you know, um, teaching somebody on a one-to-one -one basis. Because at that moment, you can quickly identify exactly what is likely to stimulate that person. And, and that's very, very efficient teaching from the learner's perspective. You know, you've got a teacher that's targeting at you. As soon as you get two people or N plus one, you know, just suddenly you're diluting something as a teacher. You're saving a lot of money from your economies of scale and everything and blah, 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 blah. It's very effective. You might produce one course book and have one teacher that does it in the course book. But, but you're not really targeting that as a, you know, as a hobby for everybody in the class. You know? So you've got to find out what it is that you know, makes somebody tick. And you can do that on a one-to-one -one basis. But it's very difficult to do that if you've got a bigger class. But... Obviously, that's the way that you, you help somebody learn. You, you, you stimulate them, you, make, you, you position the, the language or the, the things that you're discussing to be um, hobby-like in them so that you actually promote interest in them. But you can't do that with more than one person in the group very easily. I think you are absolutely right. I'm currently reading a book called Predictably Rational by Dan Ariely. Mm -hmm. He's a, a guy from oh. Israel. Ah, oh, okay. And he... He talks in one part about the fact that if you were being paid for going hiking, mm -hmm. you would probably detest it. Not going hiking specifically. He didn't point out to this. I cannot think of the specific example he gave in the book, but I know the concept. It's that, for example, going to the beach. If you were paid for going there, you would hate it. Because that's... I don't understand why people like going to the beach. It's... I only go because I have it near my house and because it's a social thing and, and I got used to going there and yeah. the fact of going there, it's sort of nice. But if you analyze it objectively... It's not particularly great. It's much better to go to a nice, comfortable park somewhere where it's got nice grass and it doesn't, it doesn't fill your toes with sand. That's it. That's it, yeah. But society says that going to the beach is really good for you and it's really good fun. I mean, the sea air is pretty good for you. You know, but for people to really feel the benefit of the sea air, you've got to be fairly in touch with your own body. 
you know, to actually sort of get that benefit. But generally, going to the beach is a fairly uncomfortable mess because you've got to wash yourself afterwards. You come back all sandy and there's sand all around the house. And you know, it's, it's not as great as everybody says it is. So the basic point is that we consider that experience to be worth it because we're not getting paid for it. Okay. Because that's free. Yes. And we get mad at things that are free. We are not able to be rational about things that are free. Mm -hmm. And in one of the ways that then I really points out to our irrationality when free things appear in our life is that we end up doing things that if we were paid by for doing that, mm -hmm. we would detest it. Okay. And right. that shouldn't be the case. So, so extending that argument, what you're saying is that um, if you paid to go to the beach, you'd enjoy it even more. Yeah, yeah. And that happens, actually. Okay. It's not linear and that it's not proportional right but it happens in the sense of if you are paying for something and it has costed you a lot mm -hmm. you will derive a sense of pleasure from it in a way that you will not from something that's better but free because you assume its existence you don't value it okay if we bring that concept or that idea into teaching there, there probably has to be an optimum price that people are prepared to pay Uh, for language learning, for example, you know, because if they're paying a large amount of money and for whatever reason, you know, they just don't have the, the desire or the will on that particular day to actually study or if there's a test that's been organized and you think, I don't want to do a test because it won't really, it's not what I'm looking for. I, I don't want, to, you know, I want to have input, not output and blah, 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 blah. At that moment, they miss the class and then they miss a few more. And then in the end, you, it's a bit like going to the gym and paying for a gym membership, you know, Because people pay to go to the gym, they don't keep going. They still stop, you know, in March, having started in January. You know, I mean, it, it is a way that people, you know, paying a bit of money, you think I, I have to actually sort of, I have to pay some money to keep me going there. If gyms were free, they'd probably be empty. I agree with that. But there comes a point where you must, you probably think to yourself, no, I've, I've lost so much money now because I haven't been going, you know, for whatever reason. And at that moment, you stop going because you're wasting money. So there's probably uh, an optimum amount of money that each individual is prepared to pay to make it actually worthwhile to do all of these things or stimulating enough for them to do it or for them to go. Does that make sense? Are you with me or not? Yeah, yeah sure. Okay. sure. Right. Th there's an amount, but maybe trying to pinpoint to the exact amount that each one of your customers might be willing to pay mm -hmm. is not optimal because the, whatever system you, you designed in order to analyze their, I don't know, their income, their expenses their balance sheet of mm -hmm. whatever they've been doing for the last five years. You analyze it and you determine what's the best rate that you can charge them. And if it's worth it even to charge them, because maybe they are going to, to be able to pay maybe five euros an hour and you say, okay, for five euros an hour, I prefer just not doing it. But I'm, I'm not totally convinced this is really... Oh, no, no, I haven't, guys, I haven't finished the point. Okay, guess, uh, I was referring to that maybe doing this analysis is not worth it. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. Because going... There's a point in precision in your analysis that it is suddenly, well, not maybe not suddenly, it transitions to not being worth it. Mm -hmm. If you analyze something with the least amount of precision possible, you only see sh shades. You only see the abstract concepts in the, in the far away. Mm -hmm. But if you start analyzing super precisely, you start seeing the, the atoms. So you have to see the doing a too of a precise analysis is not worth it. And there's a point in the spectrum of how precise you are with your analysis. Mm -hmm. There's a point in which there's an optimal point of precision with analysis towards determining what's the precise point of charging your customers. Right. And this is a sort of a meta-analysis of, right. of what you said, and you could also do a meta-meta-analysis. Okay. When I originally said that um, trying to make... Um, teaching as productive as possible or as beneficial to the learner as possible, you've got to try and actually position that as a, as a hobby. Sure, sure. Now, now, obviously, people do invest some monies in their hobbies. It depends what hobby it is. But generally, you know, going for a walk in the mountains every, every Sunday afternoon for five or six hours doesn't cost an enormous amount. You've got to buy the shoes and the stuff. And you've got to get in the car and fill it out with petrol. It might cost a bit of money. But generally, it's free. It's you go by car? To drive to the mountains to go walking. I mean, if I live in Irun, if I want to go up Chindoki, I, I'm not going to walk there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll drive there first and then plan a four or five or six hour walk. 
So, yeah, I think that if you position it as a hobby, um, yeah, it's effectively free. But you have to make it a fun experience for them. Because it's not only a means to something. It's a means and an end. Right. So it's the instant feedback of worthiness of whatever you are doing mm -hmm. that leads to a maximization in the capability of producing a worthy outcome in the long term. Right. We humans are not perfect creatures. We are not able to endure through the desert for millions of years. Mm -hmm. Not millions of years, our life expectancy is like 80 years. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make any sense. But we wouldn't be able to endure something if it was too hard. Mm -hmm. So you've what's endurance? We talked about this the last day. Mm -hmm. Endurance is basically going through a hard situation without getting instant satisfaction. Okay, well, of, that's what generally what a hobby is. I mean, it's it's generally pleasurable most of the time while you're doing it. That's it. Okay, so I know people start to learn a language, especially adults, um, because they need the language for a specific goal, for a job normally. Uh, or to travel normally. But if you're only doing it for that reason, you can, you can lose sight of that far off goal, obviously. So, so it's, I think you said earlier on, it's about actually trying to keep people um, practicing the muscle or your brain or whatever it is to actually keep using it and actually think, well, I'm, um, I'm now better at saying, uh, con conveying my thoughts in a foreign language than I was yesterday. So it's constant feedback that you're getting and an opportunity and think, wow, I've, I've just discussed a topic that I've never even talked about in, in my own language before. And I've done it in English because I've got a compassionate listener who, who's, who's sort of connecting the dots of what I'm saying, even though I'm not expressing them very, very well. And um, so that's what I think you have to go for. You, you, it's actually just enjoying the process of speaking all the time and listening and understanding what a foreigner says. That's the way I teach anyway. It absolutely makes sense. Because if we were capable of enduring for long periods of time mm -hmm. without having a short term benefit, or, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we wouldn't really need this. But you've adapted to human nature in order to maximize the fulfillment of the objective that's learning English. Do you think that people go through this sort of process, though, of analyzing? No. No. <laughs> It's just a fact that you've made it. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you're, you're breaking it down into the reason why people, you know, you're explaining why they feel that pleasure or whatever. But if you don't do it, mm -hmm. you just came, came into the fact of having a successful business. Mm -hmm. But that's random. That's just doing trial and error randomly. And then suddenly something sticks to the... That's how I've become the teacher that I have, though. Well, it's, I, it's, you know, that works, that doesn't work. You know, that's called learning, isn't it? You could argue that I have never made something that's not due to this process. Mm -hmm. But if you don't analyze what's the thing making your business successful, okay. you're... You don't need to analyze it, though. You can intuit it, can't you? Oh, yeah, sure. Okay. So the analysis, I think, is, is something that with your view of the world might do to justify scientifically why it works. But I think um, the way that I work, I don't break it down to such first principles and biological or metaphysical explanations for all of these things. I just think that worked. I'll remember that, you know, and I can see my student smiling because he's better than he was yesterday. And I go, okay, we'll do more of that next time. And then, and then I learn that actually I can't keep doing that because he's got bored of that approach, in which time I'll, I'll do something different. But so it's just this idea of just keeping them enjoying something, um, doing the process and, and, and getting him or her to actually talk about the things that they want to talk about, you know, and occasionally throw in a different topic that goes, wow, I've never thought about that before. But then, you know, the pleasure that a student gets about talking about something that they've never considered about in their own language and being able to express it in English or in a foreign language is enormous. You know, it happens every single day for my students. You know, not all of them every single day, but I have, you know, I do six or seven classes every day. And there's always somebody that goes, wow. You know, I was talking to a student today about um, old people and uh, whether he thought that they were becoming more and more irrelevant in society now with the pace of technological change. And this is a student that's got you know, a, a pre-intermediate level of English, you know, and he just thought at the end of it, I've just had a conversation about that topic that I've never thought about in Spanish before in pre-intermediate English with, with Phil, you know, and I understood everything he said. 
and he understood everything I said too, you know, and it was enormously satisfying. So you've got to try and find that sort of, those topics which are novel, I suppose, that people haven't talked about before. And, th you know, that's what's stimulating. It's just any good teacher, you know, it's, it's about um, can you make your student's life stimulating? Are there many levers you have to pull in order to find what ticks your student? Or, or I, are, are I, there just like five kinds of personalities that you can ooh, find out? Yeah, well, I, mean, the, 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 I mean, I'm sure there are 16 different types of personalities. So that's one of them. And, and, but generally, if you talk about something that affects that everybody's got, You know, I mean, if somebody's interested in sport, then they generally want to talk about sport. Okay, and if they're bass, they want to talk about food and weather. Okay, you know, those are the safe areas. In it. And if I'm teaching a group of people and I don't know what to do, you know, I'll say, well, let's talk about food. And, and they're a class of Basque people, and they'll all have an opinion about it. You know, or we'll talk about weather, and that's what English and Basques have got in common. And we like to talk about how miserable the weather is generally. But I think that. Um, you can always talk about children and you can always talk about parents to most people because they've had, they've, at some point, they've been a child or they've got kids and they will be, you know, <laughs> old or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and people don't normally think about that. They get lost in this idea of their responsibility as a, um, as a parent, you know, but they don't necessarily consider that they're still a child to their parents. And, and putting that idea into their heads, they've got the ability to sort of put themselves into a position where they're not at the moment. You know, they can always talk about how uh, what it's like to be a grandparent although they don't have that, that experience firsthand themselves but they they love that when they have to be a little bit abstract but they've got the tools to talk about something because they they only have to see what their parents are like with their children if you see what i mean the difference between grandparents and yeah. and grandchildren so um is there what was your question again is is there a formula or are there levers that you can um i think it's just about being perceptive and you know being able to, i mean i normally change the subject in any class about five or six times. In a, in a half an hour class, I'll talk about five or six different things, um, normally, just because it's great to actually be talking about one thing and then just to quickly sw switch the sub subject, you know, because I know as a, as a language learner that is, um, switching subjects is incredibly difficult straight away because you're just like, where, 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 where's the context? Where's the context? And when you switch the subject, you, you just lower the speed that you're speaking, you know, and, uh, and then as they get into the subject they're they're contextualizing where they are and at that moment you can i can start speaking at almost full speed and for most students and they'll understand so it, yeah it's it's switching it around it's really important to to jump around in topics so are you just getting a feel of what takes them the most or are you trying to constantly be switching between topics because that's the the best way to maintaining the highest point of It's a brilliant question because one thing I haven't told you is that all of my students now, nearly all of them, I teach on the telephone, so they don't see me. So oh wow! I, so I don't have that facial feedback. But but again, if you only teach on the telephone, you, you can detect whether people are concentrating or not, you know, by the tone of their voice uh, and how quickly they respond to you and everything. So um, yeah, I mean, if I, I don't normally identify boredom. In, in one of my students' voices, but a lot of people that do have boring voices. And in that situation, I just say, look, I'm losing interest in you because you've got a boring voice when you speak to me. And they go, thanks very much, Phil. You know, and I say, well, try smile when I talk to you. When, you, when, when you're speaking English, just smile. And at that moment, they go, wow, well, it's, it's actually, you know, I'm getting more feedback from Phil. I do challenge my students in that way. You know? don't, but don't they take it badly because you are being too explicit? Well, they know me and I, they know the character that I am. No. I, I love that. That's like, do you know any Russian person? Any Russian person? Yeah. Ah, yeah, well, I, I have, well, um, Russians, Slavic people in general, I mean, but I don't, I've never taught any Russians, but I've, I have taught various Slavic people. Poles, I, I, my first teaching job was in Poland. And I mean, okay, a, a Pole would not be happy about being put in the same group as Russians, okay, but they are Slavs and they are quite cold people they don't smile unnecessarily unless they have to you know yeah. they smile but you know russians have mystified why as as a neutral expression we smile what are you smiling about you know and it was a bit like that in poland too um and i learned a lot by teaching in poland it's my first year of teaching you know very cold people generally but they, they don't deal with bullshit 
No, I, I think um, no, no. But but I think most people respond to peop uh, to confidence. So I mean, if if I challenge you and and I say things to you that normally make you react in a negative way but if you trust me as a confident person and I'm smiling at you I can't do it on the phone but I can use my intonation on the phone you can say well Phil's playing devil's advocate here you know this is quite fun yeah yeah and on a one-to-one -one basis that's very easy to do in a group class there'll always be somebody that's dissatisfied and there'll always be somebody that's trying to disrupt the class teaching groups is very difficult but you cannot do that suddenly you cannot set one day be the, the best devil's advocate ever and the rest of the days let's say you you meet me one day and for like five months you've never had this kind of interaction with me and then suddenly you criticize something deep in my person i would take it horribly <laughs> if i knew that you are the kind of person that did this and right. it and that is it's nothing personal it's just the way you are and that i can trust yeah. that you're acting in, in good faith mm -hmm. i would take it positively Okay, that's interesting because because I would say six or seven times a year I get new students. And the first class, I need 15 minutes to explain to them how I teach and what, what I'm going to do. And the uh, biggest restriction to, to learning language by adults is breaking down what they think that they have to do to be good at language. You know, It's normally based on their past experiences of language learning. And they go, it wasn't very good because... I didn't have a native teacher or I wasn't very good because I didn't study hard enough, you know, and it's normally, it, normally it comes from, from school and, and, you know, they didn't really concentrate very much. So they think that they have to concentrate. They think that they have to learn phrasal verbs. They, they think they have to have a better understanding of grammar. And I just go, forget all of that. Forget all of that. And they go, really? Because that sounds like quite a nice thing to be told. Forget about phrasal verbs and forget about grammar because that's the hard stuff, you know. But And you just tell them, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to uh, get you to talk about the things that you like talking about. And they normally say, well, uh, you know, and every single class, I always, you know, pick up the phone and I telephone somebody and I say, what would you like to talk about today? And 80% of the time they say, I haven't thought of anything. We'll do what you want to do, Phil. You know, and I go, that's a bit frustrating. You know, so then I tell them about what's happening in my life and, and, and my thoughts about things. And, you know, me as a child, me as a parent, me as a, you know, looking for, for a relationship. And... Um, Normally, I introduce all of my topics with a little anecdote, you know, so, so that then at that moment, they can relate to my, my specific situation. And then at that moment, they are contextualized. They can put themselves in my shoes. And at that moment, they can, you know, and people love giving recommendations to people. Yeah, they love doing that. You know, so I play the learner, you know, and, and, and I allow them to play the educator in life, not as a language teacher, obviously, yeah. but in life. And people love doing that. And, it, and generally, the higher up they are in an organization, the more they like doing it, because I like the sound of their own voices. Yeah, sure. Yeah. But that makes absolute sense if, if you check the, the current knowledge of the human nature. Mm -hmm. we, we like feeling as if we are being capable to add value to the society. Yep. And how do you feel that? By having someone in front of you or right, yeah. via telephone that is telling, oh, your insight is actually valuable. Mm -hmm. that makes people be satisfied yeah because they're they're wired to to do that to be to be satisfied by the feeling of being helpful to the community that's yeah and uh, and i said a moment, moment ago that um it's generally people higher up in an organization or more educated or people that that like doing it more but not necessarily i mean that's one of the great things about i mean at the moment i've um Because my my I'm, I'm looking for for love at the moment in a relationship. People are dying to hear about my experiences. You know, they're absolutely fascinated by it. I was speaking to a woman uh, this morning, and um, she said, "How's it going? You know, what's your relationship with blah 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 like?" And I go, it's going through, "I'm going through a bad time at the moment. What's the problem?" You know, and I said, "Ah, you see." You know, and she's a forty something year old woman who can give me advice about you know what women do. Uh, you know, my life is almost open source to people. People can come and hack it as much as they like. <laughs> They've always got an opinion. But, but yeah, if you just tap into everyday things that, that face everybody, you know, and if, if you don't do it constantly to the point that it becomes boring, but if you switch it around a little bit, you know, there's always something to talk about. And I, th I think the reason why I've been as successful, uh, I mean, I don't want to say it's as successful, but I don't think most people should stick with uh, one teacher for, for many, many years. Okay, but most of my students I've been teaching for over eight years, you know, which is amazing. So I must be doing something right, I think, without 
or, or wrong. Or doing so. <laughs> yeah, you're probably right, actually. Yeah, you're probably right. But no, 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 no. Because because the thing is, I mean, what do you? Um, how do you perceive your own improvement? You know, your willingness to keep doing it. You know, to keep practicing. You know, I think is the key thing. Because I mean, with business people who um, who who are constantly looking for results, you know, they go away and in a conference in London the first year and the next year they go to the same conference and they go I was better than last year you know so I must be improving you know and that's how they generally judge whether they're improving or not or video conferencing and it was much better this week than it was three weeks ago you know that's how most people assess their own their own improvement but just doing something uh, and enjoying it you know and knowing that you're not speaking Spanish or in the or the L1 the first language is enormously rewarding. That's much, much better feedback than getting feedback every year. I've been going to the conference in London, you know, and, and, and people just think, wow, I've just had a conversation in another language that I've never had a conversation about in my own language. Um, and then the whole business of learning just happens naturally after that because they just they keep talking, they're, they're, they're exercising that brain muscle or body memory or whatever, you know. They, they're exercising speaking English and that's what they're motivated by do you think that the figure of nouns the, the grammar in general mm -hmm. is redundant and we could just focus like, this is something I wish I could do in German mm -hmm. I wish I could just focus on writing mm -hmm. reading listening and speaking okay without going through the process of doing grammar and cases and all of those I hate grammar yeah and that's I've gone through grammar a few years ago in, in English mm -hmm. that's probably why I have a base of not aberrant grammatical errors <laughs> but I think that most of my improvement in English came from not doing raw exercises in on paper it's it's through the experiencing of the language This, this is interesting because um, um, I imagine when, I mean, I don't know much about the Spanish education system, but I imagine that in learning Spanish or Basque, you do have grammar lessons in those uh, at school, Yeah, I guess. Well, um, I've got four brothers and sisters. There's five of us. And uh, we all happened to, um, when we were at school in the UK, we, um, there was a 10-year experiment where they decided that in English language teaching to English students, they wouldn't do any grammar. And I was part of that experiment. I didn't realize at the time I was part of that experiment, but I've since found out that I was part of the experiment. Uh, so we never looked at grammar. When, and when I started working as an English teacher at the age of 29 or 30, when I went to the process of learning, you know, um, I only knew three things about grammar. I knew what a noun was, I knew what an adjective was, and I knew what a verb was. That was it. You know, I went in to, to become a language teacher knowing that a verb was a doing word. Okay. <laughs> okay. An adjective was a describing word. And a noun was a person, place, or thing. Because that was the extent of my grammar. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's amazing, isn't it? So, and then I suppose the other example is if, if you ever go to Morocco, for example, and you're walking in the, uh, what's the best place to give a Marrakesh, and, and there's lots of you know, kids there, you know, exploiting tourists, you know, they know within 50 meters of you actually arriving what language you speak, you know, they'll go, hola, que tal, or buongiorno, you know, just because they, they know, they know, you know, but they can speak all of those languages and they can sell everything that they want to sell to 20 different nationalities. Okay, and they haven't looked at a grammar book in their lives. These kids, they probably, many of them don't even go to school. They certainly don't have Italian, um, Hebrew, um, English, German and French classes because no, they don't. But they, but they, you know, if you ever go and watch them, you know, they'll see the next person. They change, they're speaking six or seven, ten languages every single day. You know. um, how do they learn languages? You know, they, they listen and then they repeat. And they practice and they see what works. And I think that's why grammar teaching is not necessary. It shouldn't be necessary, especially if you're starting with somebody who's very, very young, because it's a program language, isn't it? And you just, you, 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 your, your brain adapts to what the grammar is. And it, it, it's, a, it's a logic to most grammar. 
nearly all grammar that's like, based on logic. Um, the only time I really teach grammar now, sometimes there are people that say, I don't get it, Phil. I know. I need the bones. I need the skeleton language. You know, tell me what the grammar is. I was like, okay, if I have to, I will. You know, and they go, thank you very much at the end of it normally. You know, or I have to explain it a couple of times. But I don't think it's necessary. You have to change the mindset of what it means to learn a language. Maybe I'm lucky because English is not a very strong grammatical language, if that makes sense. You know, we, don't, we haven't got loads and loads of cases. And um, you know, German's a nightmare of a language to learn for grammar purposes. You know, absolutely, it's a pig of a language. English is much, much easier. It's just pronunciation, really. How do you deal with the fact that the correlation between phonetics and how the language is written is almost zero in English yep. and almost one in Spanish? Yep. How do you deal with that? In okay, that's a great question as well. I know the phonemic alphabet. You know, you know when you look in a dictionary yeah. and you've got that pronunciation guide, it's, got, it's in those little sort of diagonal lines. I know it. And most good teachers should know it too. And in the classroom situation where you've got a board and you write it down, Now, normally, there's an enormous resistance to this. You know, I'm, I'm learning English, but then you want me to learn characters that you use as well. And you go, trust me, it works. It works. I remember I was teaching in, uh, in Andoain. I was teaching at a school there. And uh, I wasn't allowed to teach the kids because I needed the Ega in the Basque language to be able to teach there. But I could teach the teachers. So I used to teach the teachers for, and I taught them for about three years. And they had enormous resistance to this idea of learning to speak with perfect pronunciation, you know, not just through mimicking and copying, but for using the, the phonemic text that you get. And, uh, and I remember I would start every single lesson with, um, you know, with something written in phonemics. And they'd look at it and just go, whoa, 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 what's that? Okay. And then I'd say, well, okay, which, which sounds don't you know? And they go, well, that one, that one, that one. Okay. Well, that, that funny at sound. Okay. That's the at as in cat. Okay. You got that one? And that's a blah, 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 blah. And then they would read it and they go, can I have a, some chocolate cake, please? Okay. And they go, I go, that's perfect. Okay. What did I just say? Can I have some chocolate cake, please? And I go, no, 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 no. Look at the text. Look at the text. Can I have some chocolate cake, please? Yeah. And they go, well, you, you just sound incredibly English. So that's fun because they can see, and, and in a group class as well, they can see that he suddenly sounds really English, but really, is he speaking English? It's perfect. So phonemic, the phonemic alphabet is fantastic, but you have to have the confidence, like, uh, like most things, to say it's going to work. Trust me. You know, it's not another language. It won't hurt you. You know. So, yeah. It's like any job with by an expert. If they, if they speak with confidence and you gain their trust, you can make them do anything. What do you think of fake it until you make it? In language learning? In everything. Oh, dear Or, me. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I think you have to believe it as well as faking it. It's, I mean, just faking and making... I mean... You know, it's, it's a lovely little catchphrase, fake it till you make it. And it has its purpose in some ways, you know. But people don't, it, that's the other thing. I mean, because of people's education uh, or failed learning at school, all of my students are over, over 45 years old. They have a real resistance to actually imitating an English voice. Okay, because they remember being at school when they were 11 or 12 years old. And the one that had a good English pronunciation, you know, everybody else would go, you know, you're trying too hard. So, you know, that's not cool. You can imagine the situation, can't you? I, I've lived it. Yeah. And you probably were the one that pronounced quite well. No, what was the opposite? Oh, really? really? Okay, really? I, I've been the one with the worst pronunciation until recently. Oh, really? Okay. Uh, so you know what I mean? People feel stupid or you, they get intimidated by their class members. Yeah. And that's, that lives with people as they get older too. They don't really want to say it like an English person. Everybody's got a comedian in their country that imitates people speaking English. Okay. Obviously, they don't use any English words. Okay. But they just, they just speak their you know, Spanish but with an English accent. Yeah. She said, speak to me imitating that style of speaking. Yeah, and I think that's quite good fun. And then you've, well, actually, you now sound a lot more English than you did before. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And after a while, if everybody does it, you know, the, the group confidence goes up. It's quite good fun, really. No. So do you think this is something exclusive of Spain or does it also happen in other countries? 
the uh, th this idea of being embarrassed about um, uh, having good pronunciation, you mean, in a classroom situation? Is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah. No, I don't think it's exclusive. Um, and um, I also teach in France, or French students, and, uh, and it's, French are, are very reluctant to actually put stress in the right place because French is very monotonous. It's a little bit like this, and it's like a river flowing, you know. And, you know, and they don't stress the thing. And I remember I spoke to, I was teaching one student, it's very high level, and I was trying to, I gave him a text to read, and I said, just read that text. And I said, it's, it's you know, you've, you've got fantastic English, but you've got really boring pronunciation, you know. It's really, really bad, you know. And he said, are you saying that I've got to read it like an actor, you know, and put stress in it? And I go, well, yeah, you know. Because even in, I think even in France, you know, they like to you know, act a little bit and change their stress pattern a little bit. So to try it, Jérôme, try it. You know, okay, I will. You know, and and in the end, it's much better. But it's it's not easy for them, you know, especially in a group situation. You know, but confidence is the main thing. If they trust what you're doing, you know, I mean, I, I'm um, for low-level adult students, I tell them to watch Peppa Pig. You know. And, I, and I, I often put Peppa Pig on Peppa Pig videos. You know Peppa Pig, yeah. 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 And I play play them in, in you know in a class. And, and I'm sure at times they go, you know, I'm in the middle of my day. I've got an English class at lunchtime. Uh, I've got to contact these people. You know, they're high level executive people. You know, or high level in their jobs, and they're watching Peppa Pig. It's quite it's quite challenging for them to sort of justify why they're in my class watching Peppa Pig. You know? <laughs> but but if you can play Peppa Pig or watch a couple of Peppa Pig episodes in a class, and and they trust you, you've got them. So you have to sort of you have to you have to be a clown yourself, I think, um, and then say that's cool. Peppa Pig's cool. You know, even for fifty-five-year-old businessmen who are shareholders in the company, you know. I think the the origin of why we we feel embarrassed by trying too hard in English while in the in the process of improving mm -hmm. is the ingrained feeling of seeking for status that we have. Ooh. If if it wasn't for the ingrained system or however you want to call it that we seek for status because that's the currency of the, the most valuable currency ever if you feel that you are high in the hierarchy of people around you mm -hmm. the odds of you having a good supply of food historically was high mm -hmm. uh, whatever mating partners shelter security everything everything would be better if you were high in the in mm -hmm. the hierarchy so we're wired for being high in the hierarchy and those who who did not mm -hmm. haven't survived so there's a survival bias there so i think that if it's precisely due to this because admitting that you are improving and that you are going through a process in which you are going to suck in the in the in the start mm -hmm. is admitting that you are not high in the hierarchy it's true And yeah. you have to go through that in order to maximize the, the speed at which you improve or even to, to improve. Yeah, it, that, that's a great observation because um, one of the biggest problems of having groups is that if you get somebody who is higher up in the organization and earns more money is at director level and they happen to be the weakest person in the class linguistically, they're very uncomfortable normally. So they're the ones that get the private classes, you know, one-to-one uh, -one classes because it's difficult for them to appear to be low on the hierarchy, as you say, in that class. Um, and couldn't you, maybe not you, but is there a way of making it patent that there's many different hierarchies and you, that you don't necessarily have to be high in every single one at every single moment in, in order to feel as if you are a valuable person in society? Like, let's say you are talking with uh, an executive with other people in the class and he's the worst in English couldn't you just point out to the enormous value he adds to society while you are also criticizing his English so he doesn't take it personally or that he's able to see that oh I have some flaws but I'm also a valuable person so I'm not there's some hope of me improving in this right I'm, Okay, I would say that most modern companies now, people who get to the top are the people that go through adversities. 
and they generally do. You know, they're good at what they do, and they're generally good business and are pretty good at everything they try, more or less, which is an intellectual process. Uh, and I think a lot of them actually um, are motivated by the fact, you know, that they feel uncomfortable. But that's but that's that's what you know. Big top business people like to put themselves um, in their outside their comfort zone and then achieve. You know, they are high achievers. So I think a lot of them are actually driven by this process of feeling a little bit inferior and then closing the gap on the others and then maybe even getting better than them. You know, but but that's the, the you know the new style company in Spain. There's a lot of old style companies in Spain, which where you're at the top of the organization because you always have been and your dad was or whatever. You know, it's the sort of um, you know, people are employed much more n um, now because of their skills rather than for n nepotistic reasons or whatever, or whatever, I guess. So those people who inherited their position mm -hmm. might be less outgoing in, in terms of admitting that they are bad in something. Yeah, and they generally avoid learning a language as a result of that because, you know, they don't want to work for a company where, they're, um, where their, their weaknesses are exposed, you know, and then... And then Generally, they they retire at 60 and and they get replaced by in the company by somebody that's a bit younger with a bit more of an uh, a greater skill set and things like languages. You know, nowadays, I, I think that happens a lot more. People are employed based on their their learning capacity rather than their whatever reasons that they were put in that position that doesn't involve them to be like that. If if you could choose between having a skill and a meta skill, the capacity to learn. Mm -hmm. Would you pause it or would you choose the one that, what would you choose? It depends how busy I am, I suppose. How much time, you know, the, the process of learning something and knowing how you learn is fantastic if you know how you learn. But if you're in a hurry to get somewhere quickly and if you could just give me a, if, if you could give me a skill that I could speak perfect Spanish tomorrow or you know, the, the meta language version of that and the ability to, I, I would take the instant language straight away. Because you're more in a hurry than yes. what would be required to think of something that will have a feedback or like... Yeah, my process. life would be instantly better if I could speak, wake up tomorrow and speak English, uh, Spanish instantly without going through the pain of doing it. But what's your discount rate? What's my what? Your interest rate. What yeah. do you mean by that in this context? You are discounting time hugely. You are saying, now, if I'm able to get this thing which is valuable instantly, I value it a lot. But if I'm going to be able to get it maybe in a year, I don't value half as much. Being who I am at the moment, mm -hmm. and with the other goals I have in society, just being given the ability to speak in a language tomorrow um, is worth gold to me, you know. Gold dust. Okay. I don't know if that's answered your question, but yeah, yeah, it yeah. makes all the sense. Yeah. I could buying a house, buying a car, finding love, integrating with other groups of people, but immediately be, be facilitated instantly. And I could do all of that. You know, the, the biggest challenge in my life at the moment is I mean, I'm lucky enough to have been invited into a sort of quadrilla since December. That's, that's amazing, being accepted by a group of people. And I'm, I'm funny, Phil, the English man. And that one of my students introduced me into her, her group of friends. So I'm enormously privileged by that because it's not easy entering, entering any quadrilla. It's not a classic quadrilla where the, you know, it started when everybody was four years old. You know, but it's, it was a quadrilla that was created as a result of uh, the, uh, the lockdown and the pandemic and everything. And they all decided that they would meet and go off for a walk. So it's a very flexible quadrilla. But even then, they've invited me, who, who's not very good at speaking, into the group. Enormously generous. And, uh, and they said, you know, in the end, Phil, you know, we'll just keep talking and, and, and you'll get it. You know, your Spanish will improve. Well, it doesn't work like that, I don't think. Um, not for me anyway. I mean, uh, I think there are the two good ways of learning a language. Um, I think I mentioned to you before, you've got submersion where you actually have to communicate with people to be able to survive. Well, that doesn't apply to me here. Uh, although I'm in the, the target language country i want to learn spanish and i'm in the best country in spain if you like without getting too political about it um i don't need to speak spanish to survive because i need to earn money to survive and and i speak english to survive to earn money 
So the other thing is that you haven't, what I call it, like a, a language parent. You know, so you've got somebody, one person, that will make a real big effort to understand what you're talking about and will speak at you at a speed that you understand. Okay. If I go out with my quadrilla and, and there's, there's 12 of them there, you know, and I'm sitting at a table having a drink or whatever, there's invariably three different conversations going, at, going on at any one time. You're probably in a bar or a restaurant. There's probably some music going on, you know. And, and, and they're relaxed because it's Friday or Thursday night or Saturday night. You know, they don't want to all speak slowly so that Phil understands. Nightmare. So, so I just throw myself into this um, in, environment for two, three or four hours on a, on a Friday night. And, and I normally come home feeling fairly depressed because I haven't really understood very much because nobody's really tried, you know, to actually bring me into the conversation. And uh, they're very good because they don't speak English to me which is good because you know I'm forced to understand them but and they don't and they don't speak in English to me because they don't know English so and if you don't know English as a Spanish person you you probably have only one language which is Spanish which means you've never learned a language which means you don't really know how to speak to people who are trying to learn a language you know so I go out on Thursday nights every week and and uh, and they go come on Phil come on Phil we'll speak to you in Spanish and and actually it's incredibly disappointing most of the time because I, I'm, I, there's four or five different conversations with people who are wanting to see their friends and they're just blah, 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 you know. And there's, there's three conversations and I move from one and listen to one and I go, that's quite interesting. No, no, they're talking about politics. I'll go over here and listen to this conversation. No, no, I'm not interested in that one. And they're speaking too fast. So, you know, I need a language parent. And I think that's how I teach. It's very easy to be a language parent on a one-to-one -one basis. You know, you speak at a speed that people understand. You know what vocabulary they understand. Um, so actually, it's incredibly difficult learning a language in those environments, unless it's submersion. And I don't have submersion because eight hours a day I'm speaking English. How much would your life improve if you found the equivalent of the feel in Spain in the UK? Say that again, the, the, the what in Spain? The equivalent of you here. You're an English person in Spain who teaches English rather uh -huh. rather well, so, so. Yeah, yeah. but doesn't know the local language. Right. What if you found the Manolo okay. in the UK who doesn't know English, but he knows how to teach Spanish rather well? Yeah, that'd be great. Why, why didn't you look for him on the internet? Oof, I don't know. Um, or, or what search would I put in there? Manolo. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm not on the internet. I don't do any advertising for my services at all. I've never done any advertising because the best form of advertising is word of mouth. People know if there's a good teacher around, you know. So I've never done any advertising at all. That's interesting. Uh -huh. It's interesting when you said that, I said quite happily that I must be doing something right because I've been teaching most of my students for eight years and you said, or something wrong because I'm still teaching them after eight years. Yeah. You know, they're not learning very quickly. Yeah, I've never done any advertising. And maybe it's because in this society people talk about, you know, I'm interested in children doing after-school activities and what they choose to do. You know, most of them start off by saying, little boys, for example, they normally want to be like Messi or Ronaldo, and they want to they want to learn to play football. Okay, and then when they play football, you know, somebody in the group says, you know, you're rubbish. You're not as good as I am. And then you think, okay, and then the parents say, well, maybe you should go and do that instead. You know, do judo, try something different. And, and actually, the own, the own, if you live in a big city, everything's available. There'll always be good teachers for somewhere. But if you live in a place like Irun, okay, it, you, should, you should get your kids to do the thing where the best teacher is. So, you know, so if it's archery and you've got a really good teacher, send your kids to do that. How do you judge that? By the teacher's passion for what they're doing. I think anybody that likes talking about their job is probably quite good at it. I love talking about my job. I mean, I've just, I've just been really arrogant saying I'm good at my job. Yeah, it, but it makes sense what you say. Yeah. You, you're 100% right. And nothing points out to you your incompetence. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because you love what you do because you're improving all the time. Yeah. If you're a good teacher, you should improve all the time. Yeah. Okay. And you see the satisfaction in the people that you're teaching. You also see the dissatisfaction. I'm not saying that every one of my students thinks that I'm the greatest thing in the world. Not at all, you know. Is satisfaction, I would proxy to how well they are learning, because that's subjective, not being satisfied. Um, satisfied or enthusiastic. 
yeah, if people are enthusiastic to come to your classes. I mean, there's another ingredient that I haven't mentioned, and we're going off on a bit of a segue here. All of my students, 95% of my students are working in company. And some of them have classes at eight o'clock and some of them, you know, at any point in the day between eight o'clock and five o'clock. I think a lot of the time I teach people or people come to my classes, not with the specific objective of learning a language. That's very secondary after a while. They come to switch off from their work for half an hour. I remember I was teaching somebody who worked in Andawine again. Very, very nice man. And he said, after about a year of being his teacher... He said, do you know why you're my teacher? You know, why I employ you? And I said, I don't know. I, I hope I'm a good teacher and I hope you're learning. Um, this was about 15 years ago. And he said, no. He said, you give me an opportunity to switch off from my work for an hour and a half, twice a week. And the, the, sort of the byproduct of doing that is that I know that my English is improving, but I'm not actually, that's not why I've, you know, I'm, my, my main objective is to switch off from work, you know. If, if I sit down and I go to the coffee machine and have a coffee, somebody would come next to me and talk about work. You know, but if, I'm, if you're in my office talking to me for one and a half hours, you're not going to talk about my work and I'm not going to talk about my work. You know, so, so after one and a half hours of break from, from my work, I can then go back to my work feeling refreshed. So you're basically an expensive substitution to meditation. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Or, or a bit of psychology is going on there as well. And, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I've noticed that more and more and more. Yeah, um, I mean, even this year, I mean, people have said that several times to me. You know, I'm a bit disappointed on, on the one hand because they're not employing me for my English. But at the same time, if, if, as long as they're employing me for something, I'm quite happy. My rates don't change. I still charge the same. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's great. But that's why I pointed out to the fact that maybe you should be able to do an analysis, a precise analysis of what's the thing that added value in you. Right. So in case things change, you can readapt to that thing that you are the best in adding value. That's an interesting question, because if we're talking about threats, to and, and I, I suppose the biggest threat to a, any language teacher is that technology will actually you know, supersede the need for, for real people teaching. And there are some amazing things. You just speak into your phone and then you just put it next to the Chinese person and it will say it in perfect Chinese. So that is a danger. And I remember the first time that somebody told me about this, they said, you know, how much longer are you going to be teaching English? You know, how long is your job going to last? Because technology is going to replace you very soon. And he said it would be about five years' time. But I think that's probably why I've diversified a little bit as well. Because, you know, being human to people and, and doing a bit of psychology and distracting them from their workplace, uh, that can't be replaced by an app. That will buy you 10 years more. Or Probably, 20. Yeah, I hope so. And then I can retire, you know, 52 <laughs> now. I'm nearly done then. That'd be good. So maybe that is the reason why. Also, I mean, um, especially higher level business people. I teach at a company which is um, a multinational company. And, and English is the language, that obviously, that they use most of the time. Uh, and, and good business and good business relationships are based on trust. You know, and trust comes through, you know, meeting people, shaking their hands, seeing them, you know, and uh, and that all comes from being personable and, you know, and the whole idea that you can you know, just get a translator to do it is it's not really right. But I, I don't think most companies that are, you know, seriously looking for good partnerships with people rely on that technology unless the language is massively different. You know, if you need to use the Chinese market, you know, at that moment, you just need to communicate. But, but then you probably end up finding that the Chinese are speaking to you in English or in Spanish or whatever anyway, um, so that you've got that language. You know, um, generally, Spanish companies learn the language that they want to learn in you know, or um, um, do, do business with, unless it's China. Not many people here are going to speak Chinese, but the Chinese will learn Spanish and French and English or whatever. Do you think so? Yeah, I think so. Do you think Chinese will overthrow the world or... Not, not, not overthrow, but Spanish used to be more relevant in the in the 15th century than English, for example. Mm -hmm. But now English countries are prosperous, Spanish ones are non-prosperous. That has probably been the reason why now English is relevant and not Spanish. What what do you think about Chinese? Do you think Chinese is going to do the same thing with English as English did with Spanish in overpassing the status ranking? It might do. Um... I mean, the, the, there are Chinese people scattered all around the world. 
So if you're talking about, for example, uh, the Americans or British um, dealing with China, I mean, d- d- um, for those people in those jobs, I mean, there's so many Chinese, I mean, 1.4 billion of them. Yeah. You know, um, you know, if they need to do, if an American or British company needs to do business with China, there'll, there'll be a Chinese person living in England you know, or in America mm. who, 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 who speaks Chinese. You know, and speaks perfect English as well, and they'll be the ones that get the jobs. Um, That's a slippery slope to never learn in Chinese. Uh, for yeah, for 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 people like me and you, yeah, 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 you'd never learn it because there'll always be a Chinese person that's all. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so yeah, uh, and uh, will they take over the world or whatever? Will uh, will Chinese be the the number one language? Um, uh, probably not. You know. English will always have a special place, I think, as as you know the the the, the communication second language, you know, the mutual language that people learn. The the, the um, Ch- Chinese is incredibly difficult, obviously. Is it? I think so. I mean, it's, it's actually got quite a simple structure. I mean, they've actually got little symbols that say this is the future and this is the past. You know, so those little symbols tell you if it's past or so. It's quite logical. But but it's an absolute nightmare because you've got no letters. I mean, they're all the characters, and it's a real pain learning characters. I think. You know? I mean, I, I mean, I mean, I remember. Um, I mean, I went to China for five weeks with my family uh, three years ago, and uh, you know, we we went off the beaten track a little bit, and you know, went to restaurants and things, and uh, and quite often we would see something on the menu. Obviously, if it was if it wasn't translated in English. You had absolutely no idea what it was. Okay, so you'd point to something that maybe had a picture, and you, and, and you point to it, and you say, "What does that mean?" And uh, and and uh, and I remember there was um, um, we asked a woman this question who was working. She didn't speak any English, and uh, so 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 I tried to draw a little picture of a chicken, you know, to say, "Is that what I'm going to eat?" You know, or a cow? Am I going to eat that? Oh wow! Okay, and what she did is that she wrote down the symbol for fish. Okay, and said, that's what you're going to eat. Can I, because uh, because the, the symbol for fish was not in the, the description of the, the food. So she drew the symbol for fish to say, that's what you're going to eat. And the reason why they did this is because there's about, I don't know, 50-something different languages in China, but they all use the same characters. They can all read the same newspaper, but they can't all talk to each other. Oh, wow. So therefore, the Chinese were thinking that, you know, I mean, this, this woman obviously didn't have much of an idea of European languages and, you know, the, the alphabet that we have. You know, she just assumed that she can write to 1.4 billion people in the world. She can't talk to them. So she just extended that concept to white man who turns up not speaking the language. Well, maybe he understands the characters. There's obviously quite a lot of ignorance, not stupidity, ignorance in these places. But so I don't think I don't think these people are going to be learning English people, Americans people are not going to learn Chinese. The Chinese will be exported to learn it and then come back. I think I agree with you. Let me give the economic explanation of why this is the case. I, I know that you, you don't necessarily enjoy economics as much, but <laughs> there, with it. There, there's always an economic reason behind. Yeah. Like the GDP per capita in China is $10,000 okay. in international dollars. The, the GDP in in the US, it's like $60,000 or $55,000. Mm-hmm. That's a huge difference. But the GDP of China is $14 trillion. Mm-hmm. The one of the US is $20 trillion. The US has 350 million people and China 1,400 million people. Mm-hmm. So that's why it, it, it all sums up to, to the quantities I said. Mm-hmm. I think that convergence to someone who's fitter than you is easier because they've accumulated the knowledge to get into the super prosperous situation in which they are mm-hmm. getting in getting close to sixty thousand dollars is relatively easy if you copy the u.s system mm-hmm. which there's a huge difference between the authoritarian government in china and the functional democracy or partially functional democracy in the u.s there's a huge difference there but mm-hmm. in terms of achieving for prosperity they, they've used free markets in the way that enhances their their prosperity and so they they are converging to the US or to the West in general mm-hmm. but that convergence slows down exponentially okay yeah 
it's super hard to get super high in the ranking. Mm -hmm. Like, let's say, if China was trying to overpass Switzerland in GDP per capita, which is like ninety thousand yeah, dollars, they never get there. No. It, 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 you have to get into a point of prosperity that's super hard, and you have to be surrounded by rich countries in order to be able to have a high GDP per capita. So achieving that point, I think it's hard. And also, I think that they are stuck in having a medium GDP per capita. They will forever have it. I think that there's not going to be a point in which the GDP per capita of China is going to surpass the one of the, no. of the average in the West. They, they, they might surpass it in, in, in absolute terms. Mm -hmm. That might be the case. If China gets into $20,000 GDP per capita, that will be higher than the... The GDP of China will be higher than the one in the, the US, mm -hmm. and that will be like more rele economic relevance. But if you check what are the demographics of people who know Chinese, 99.99% mm -hmm. .99 of are Chinese. Mm -hmm. if, yep. if, if you check the demographics of English, like that's interesting. Three yeah. percent are native English, no, not native English, but English from from England. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the the, the ex colonies are super prosperous and super big. So. How many people? How many people speaking English right now, in a proficient way, are native English? Mm -hmm. Th that percentage is much, much, much lower than that of Chinese. Yeah, uh, there is a statistic actually. I, I I can't remember exactly, but it's something like um, ten percent of conversations in English globally are between native speakers. Oh wow. Something like that. It's a, you know, and 90% are between either one native and non-native or two non-natives. Um, so this is what you're saying, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So English will always have its... But Chinese can't take that over. Well, not in my lifetime or even yours. Yeah. So, yeah. And the fact that no one is learning or many less people are learning as a second language Chinese than English mm -hmm. signals that this is not a language that will benefit you yep. as much as English if you are not a native English speaker. But let's be honest, if you are American or English, the benefit of learning a second language is almost inexistent. I think so, yeah. I mean, do you know anybody um, that, um, or anybody your, your age or uh, that's studied Chinese? Yeah. Okay. I've known several, and they've all given up after quite a long time of studying. I, I, I've, I've never known anybody that's got to that level of being reasonably proficient enough to actually go to China and get a job. Um, I mean, do you know anybody that's actually got a job having learnt Chinese in this society in China? No, I've got a friend who started learning Chinese when he was 12. Okay. And he's kept it until I've stopped knowing him... I knew him regularly until we were 18, but from then on, we haven't really met. So I don't know what happened with his life, but I know that he's been keeping it until 18. Okay. Maybe in the last few years, he has stopped, but... And that's only one. I cannot extrapolate from that anything. No, no, no. But, but the concept you are saying is that it makes absolute sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's from a very, I mean, my, my, I know four or five people that had, had done it and then they gave up, normally after quite a big commitment to the language, you know, at least seven years in every case that I can think of. And they just gave up after a while. Oh, wow. But, but, I, but, but I, think, I think it's almost impossible to learn Chinese, even if you have a Chinese teacher here and a really good Chinese teacher, you know, the equivalent of, what did you say, um, Pablo or... Manolo. Manolo, yeah. <laughs> no fun, whatever, you know, um, I, I think it would be incredibly difficult because you don't hear Chinese every single day. You're not, you're not surrounded by it. Oh, yeah. Um, whereas, whereas I think if you go, I mean, if you, were, if you live in an expat community in China, well, you know, expat communities are not very good for learning languages anyway because, you know, but if you did live in China and you had a, um, a, a local um, Chinese teacher, you know, the equivalent of Manolo, um, yeah, probably they, they could learn Chinese reasonably well, Mandarin reasonably well, but it's 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 such a completely different language, you know. You know, I mean, the the, the Chinese hear English songs, you know, and watch and hear English stuff on 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 TV. We don't hear Chinese songs, yeah, in our communities. So we've got no idea. That's something that I'm I'm feeling right now with my 
German learning process. When I when I only knew Spanish, mm -hmm. the benefit of learning English was huge because I would access a huge amount of content on the internet or in the, in the world in general. Mm -hmm. So uh, there were I started to follow a few YouTube YouTube channels that they they talked about in things that they consider interesting in in those times, and. I had to improve my English because there was not an, equi an equivalent in Spanish. Mm -hmm. But that's not happening right now with German. There's nothing. You've got to start getting interested in psychology then, haven't you? What? Because Excuse me? Psychology, because there's loads of fantastic um, German psychologists in, in the last sort of 100 years. You know, their, their work obviously is translated in English. That's but, why. Yeah. yeah. There's no added value in learning German, really. Uh, unless not I'm really, living there. No, 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 not really. So I've got to live there in order to... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, unless you're... Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Yeah. So, so there's no real advent, any, bit of, any benefit at all. What, what if I move to Munich? Uh-huh. Would I be able to live with just English? Or would you just say, oh, Munich is not the most prosperous city in the world. You could certainly find one that's more prosperous with better weather, better culture that's English speaking. And so you, there's not really any benefit in going to Munich. So what's your, what's your point of view? I, I think you'd have to, if you lived in Munich, you'd probably definitely have to speak German. I mean, everybody's got this idea that um, Scandinavian countries and Germany uh, all speak really good English. My experience of Germans, they don't speak as good English or Anybody in Germany who's trying to sell you something will speak good English. Um, that, that those are the most noticeable people. Yeah, but, but they know that German's not a global language, so they can't use their German to sell you anything. You know? So the, anybody, all business people in Germany sp speak very good English, pretty much. But if you just want to just live there and, you know... I mean, I'm not talking about... You know, going to the hamburger joint and, and, and buying, you know, they won't speak English. Well, they might do, you know, probably do actually. I mean, Scandinavians speak very good English. Germans don't. But that's because the language from the Scandinavians is a low tier language. Mm -hmm. They can only communicate, communicate with like 5 million people. Mm -hmm. And so their incentives to learn the international language is huge. But the one of Germans as having a medium tier language mm -hmm. is lower. I've got many great writers and mm -hmm. things translated into German. Why would they need to learn English? Like, well, you can survive without knowing English, but the benefit is huge. Mm -hmm. And something similar happens in French and Spanish. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. No, I totally agree with you. Yeah. I think English is quite a safe job prospect for me, really, being an English teacher. There'll always be demand for it, at least for the next 15 years, and then I can retire. Yeah, sure. 15 for, for sure. For sure, yeah. Assuming the retirement age is still 67 or whatever it is. But uh, but even then, I'll probably carry on working. But in the same way that you're being able to survive here mm -hmm. and make a living in, in Spain without knowing Spanish, wouldn't I be able to do that in a, in a German-speaking city? Teaching Spanish? Not necessarily teaching, but just whatever doing whatever I do with my life in that, in that time. Um you suffer a lot because you if you don't speak the local language i mean i mean me saying that i don't speak the local language is a bit of an exaggeration you know i um, i can survive quite comfortably um i've got enough english to defender me oh, sorry spanish to defender me you know if that's right is that right it's fine yeah, yeah okay good <laughs> uh enough but i haven't got enough spanish to be much fun um, or explain to people who I really am. You, know? You're, you haven't been able to get into the wheat. Into the... Wheat. Wheat, as in... Oh, no, wit. Wit, sorry. I was thinking of um, you know, the, the, the cereal that makes bread, wheat, but wit. Um, I don't know. It's, um, no, not really. I mean, comedy is a very, very difficult thing to, um, to learn in another language. You have to dominate the language really, really well. Um, I mean... There's very different types of co uh, comedy. I mean, Spanish comedy is very different to British comedy, I think. But I think even saying that is a little bit um, stereotypical. Everybody says, you know, English comedy is great. English comedy is not all the same. It's all very different. It's just a, but, but uh, in, in England, it's most of the comedy is, is, is based on the use of words, you know, and wordplay and, 
Now, there's an enormous amount of that. The Sp- Spanish don't do that sort of wordplay jokes anywhere near as much as British do. You know, um, um, is it due to the language or to the huge amount of intelligent people <laughs> in in the English in the English language that uh, have been able to create uh, this word um, wordplay? Okay, um, I don't know. I, mean, I, I, um, I don't think it's got anything to do with intelligence. I think it's probably got something to do with the fact that English is not a phonetic language. And then you mm. can actually get two different words that appear totally different, but they, but they rhyme. Um, you know, and, and everybody thinks that their own sense of humor is the, or their own comedy is the best, apart from people who think that Monty Python you know, was the last time that there was really good comedy. You know, you know, there's lots of people of my generation that go, ah, you know, who, who are Spanish or French or German that think that Monty Python was the greatest thing that, that ever happened. And it's not, it's not particularly funny anymore. No, it's not. There's much more much better comedy all over the place. Spanish comedy is great. I think the Spanish are the, the, the best at memes. You know, every big event that happens in the world, there's, all, you know, the first memes come out of Spanish produced memes. They're fantastic at that. <laughs> They've got this fantastic capacity to do that, I think. Um, that's, well, at least I assume that they're from Spain, you know. I've seen ones that start here, you know, uh, in both, you know, in, in English as well, written in English, a lot of them. So, um, yeah. No, I, um, what was your question originally about... Um, that kind of wordplay, is it because English is more... It has a, bit, a better proclivity to doing this than Spanish, maybe? Or is it just because the average English speaker is much more prosperous or has more free time in order to dedicate it to thinking of this? I'm not sure that most English people have got more free time or have... Okay, look at this. Spain is an exception in Spanish-speaking countries. Right. The rest, they work much more. Okay, Spain. In, in Spain, okay. the, the average okay. amount, the, the amount of time invested in work is much lower than in the rest of Spanish-speaking countries. Okay. I actually thought it was quite different. I'm not a, a Spanish expert, but, but um, I thought that the Spanish actually spent more time at work, not necessarily working or being productive, Mm -hmm. but spent more time at work. In comparison to? Dutch, English. Oh, yeah, sure. You know. I think, I might be wrong, but South America, people in South America in general tend to work long hours. Right. Okay. Uh, Okay. I mean, this whole concept of presentismo is is a big thing in Spanish speaking countries as well, isn't it? You have to be at work until, you know, and then stay there until your boss leaves. That, that's horrendous. It is horrendous, yeah. But but that's a cultural thing. It's changing, obviously, because those companies don't generally do very well because it's not a very productive way of working. But but also climate has an effect on all of these things as well, doesn't it? I mean, you know, uh, you have enormous lunch breaks, or in parts of Spain, Andalusia, you know, you know they, um, well, one o'clock, two o'clock in the afternoon, you go and have lunch for two or three hours and then you come back and, and then work until eight o'clock. It's, it's a very, very ineffective way of working, but you do it because it's the best way to deal with the weather, you know. And I suppose that, that yeah, that changes things. So what do you think is the biggest thing that differentiates a Spanish and an English person? What's the biggest cultural shock you had? Right, okay, that's a good question. I think the thing that I... The British people are governed by time and the clock. It's a really, really big thing. You know, you're a good worker or you're a good person if you arrive on time for something. It's all about time. America, it's about money. How much is this worth in dollars? Britain, it's like, how much of my time is going to be taken up by this? In Spain? In Spain, I would say that it's probably fun, actually. You know, you've got a whole culture that we don't, we don't have, which is about fiesta. Yeah. It's fantastic. I thought your fiestas were the most precious thing in Spain. And I thought they really were until the pandemic came along. And they were not right, you know, there weren't undercover fiestas going on. Everybody was respecting these restrictions that were imposed on them. You know. Yeah, people in Spain are, are sheep. Uh, they're really, 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 really conformist. I was surprised. I was told earlier today that I think that the Basque country has the highest take-up of vaccinations, COVID vaccinations, If it, definitely in Europe, if not the whole world. I don't really know about if that's true. I'm amazed at that because I thought that Basques were naturally rebellious people, but they seem to be 
very conformist when it comes to matters of health and society. I think they are rebellious in terms of politics and mm -hmm. wanting their, like being nationalist. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to other things, they are just normal people. Well, that, yeah. can, that can apply to everyone. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, no, no, normal is. Uh, I mean, normal is only what is normal for your culture. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. So, uh, but, but yeah, the, the the whole concept. I mean, the the one thing that I really loved when I came here was this, this sense of community. I mean, I remember the f um, um, I came over to Spain before my before my fiance did, mm -hmm. and um, um, and I got married after a year of being living in Spain or in San Sebastian, I should say. And uh, and I remember um, this was 1999, and I live very very close to um, Buen Pastor in um, in San Sebastian, and they used to have those little telephone cabins, you know, four of them on the plaza around Buen Pastor, and I remember because um, um, I lived on uh, Reyes Catholic Catholicos. And uh, and I used to go into the plaza. I didn't have it was before mobile phones, but, and we didn't have a fixed line phone installed into our house. So I used to call my fiance from you know from from the plaza, you know, little t tilly cabin things. And I remember saying, you know, explaining to her, I said, you know, this this is this was a fantastic place to live. You know, it's nine o'clock in the evening, and there are three generations of people on the streets all having fun. There's the little kids on their little motos going around, going crazy, and then there's the parents who are there. Uh, having a glass of wine or whatever, you know, nine o'clock on a Thursday afternoon, a Thursday evening, and the grandparents are there as well, you know, pushing their children around and you know, sitting down and having drinks as well. And you've got three generations of people, nine o'clock in the evening. You know. If that had been any place in England at that time, in 1999, it would be 17 to 28 year olds. You know, that's it. People going out to get drunk. And to you know, flirt with people, you know, or get into a fight. You know, you wouldn't have grandparents on the street at nine o'clock. That's because of the weather. It's, it's largely because of the weather. Yeah, it's, it's mainly because of the weather. I would say. You know, but I just thought this is a fantastic place to be. So the, the weather determines your culture. You know, um, obviously, um, and, and that made it a really attractive place to be coming here. You know, because it's a really safe place to go out at night, and uh, and you've got you know this real sense of community all the time. But I, I think Spain is a great place to retire on or to just not be productive. Mm -hmm. But if you want to be productive, just move to other places. But if if you want to be productive in Spain, in the moment you start adding out of body to society, you will get taxed super high. You will have, find bureaucratic travel. You, you will find regulations that are absurd. Spain is not a great place to add value. No, it's not. It's a great place to consume value. Correct. Yeah. When I posted this to a Spanish person, they are like, no, Spain is great. It has the best relationship between producing and enjoying. Okay. And I'm like, no, it only has enjoying. The, the production part of Spain, obviously Spain is in Europe, so they, it's not a third world country, but mm -hmm. there's more of a first world country than Spain is. Yeah, Switzerland, for example, mm -hmm. or yeah, 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 yeah. the UK, or whatever country you want, you want to compare it with. Yeah. Those countries are much better if you want to to develop your career. Right. Okay. Yeah. 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 Th this idea of consuming and consuming stuff that makes you happy—you know, the classic fiesta thing—it's. Um, I don't know uh, whether all Spaniards actually have the benefit of that, or is it the you know the top. 50% of people that have got enough money to actually do that. I mean, I imagine there's a, a large chunk of people in, in Spain that don't really have access to this amount of funding because they can't afford it. Am I right? I mean, I have no idea. No, I don't think that Fiesta is expensive. Right. If you have time and health, you, you can do it. Right. So, well, do you have time? Maybe you need that time to earn some money to yeah, pay for it. Yeah, that was my argument. Yeah, I mean, people are working... A lot, you know, they don't really make much money. A lot of them. It's got high, got a high unemployment rate as well. In Spain that did that, have until very recently. That's where people get half the time. But that's where that's where people get the time from. Okay, from. <laughs> because they're unemployed. Okay. Yeah, but can they can they afford to go out drinking and? Well, they probably can. I don't know. I don't know. But no, it's. it's, it's I think Spain is a great place to 
retiring but then but then what really makes spain spain is actually integrating you know there's lots and lots of british people that are retired in you know in spain and they don't really experience spain they just experience the the beer the football um and the weather and the weather and cheaper beer you know and it's not really experiencing spain but although for them it is because it's you know sand sun and sangria or something rather they say i think yeah I think if, if Spain didn't have the weather that, that it has, it would be like Poland. <laughs> have you lived in Poland? It's, it's not the same food. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, not the same food, but no, the no, food no. is influenced by the climate. Absolutely. So that Absolutely. mentality of, I don't know, not really wanting to progress as much. Yeah, I think you're probably right. I think you're probably right. Although although the, the Poles are incredibly hard workers. In Britain, the, the Poles have got all of the sort of the tradesman jobs, you know, So they're working hard. But that's biased, because only the, the best people migrate. Or on average, people who migrate are better than the people who stay. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's true. Th those Poles that are on, the, on Britain are probably above average in everything. Probably. Probably. They also find learning English... More easy. stimulating. I mean, I, I worked as a, as a teacher in Poland for a year, so... Um, They learn languages. Eastern Europeans learn English very, very well, very, very quickly. But that's not really saying, you know, which Poles go and, and live in Britain. That's a different question. To wrap it up, what would you say are the things that are the low-hanging fruit that resembles a high percentage of what is relevant in terms of improving your skills or learning an ability? For example, English is, is an ability. What would you say is the basic point or the, the few things that you have to do in order to improve your skills the fastest possible? Okay. Are you looking to improve your skills to have a happier life or are you talking about skill improvement? I don't know what the ultimate standard should be. <laughs> I mean, I'm not sure about that, but just think about it in terms of English. If right. I wanted to maximize my English proficiency in the shortest amount of time possible, okay. what would I have to do? Well, the best thing to do is improve your English. Good idea. You can come to my classes, that would be quite a good one. No, 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 no. I think you've got to try and find a way of submersion into a language. Do your hobbies, any hobbies that you have, try and find YouTube videos or people speaking about your hobbies, English. You know, try and make any access to English as fun as possible. Find an English girlfriend or boyfriend. You know, the easiest way to learn a language is to do it in the most convenient, fun way where you're actually doing it because you want to always rather than you feel pressurized. As a parent, don't make your children learn English because that will just, you know, just get resentment from your kids. I suppose that your interests being that you want to read a lot and know a lot of stuff. That was the driving force for you, you know, realizing that you could access multiple more times um, stuff by learning English. But that's quite a mature reason to learn English. Most people don't have that level of maturity, even in their teens. You know, most people, they don't, do they? They just want to have fun, you know. So um, submersion is very good. Expose yourself to as much English in the fun, most fun way possible. Mm -hmm. Okay, so submersion, mm -hmm. increase of amount. That'll only come with fun. And fun. Well, that will only come with fun. Really? Yeah, because you're not going to do something as much as possible if it's not fun, and then that will just build resentment, and then you won't learn English quickly. So you've got to find any way to make it fun, really. Positioning a learning language as a hobby is the only way I think you can really learn English quickly. <laughs> 